leaders here and if you're new with us a special welcome to you for those of you who are joining us online welcome to you as well we get to participate in dedications and baptisms today so with our church family so we get to partner with our families as brothers and sisters in Christ and we get to hear testimonies of lives changed so it is an exciting morning And along with that, we're going to be singing some songs in different languages. So, but first, let's start by calling each other into worship. I want to invite you guys to stand. We're going to read scripture together. We want to refocus and recenter our minds on our God who we're here to worship. 
So I'm going to read scripture to you, and then I invite you to read the underlying portion with me. This is how God's love was revealed among us. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Read this with me. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because Jesus, God raised Jesus Christ from the dead.
The Bible tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. And as we just sing, it's a privilege to declare his name to every nation, tribe, and tongue. We live in a unique place where the nations have come to us. So as we celebrate that, we're going to hear the confession read in Portuguese and in English. Nele temos a redenção por meio do seu sangue, o perdão das transgressões, de acordo com as riquezas da sua graça. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This next song that we're going to sing is called an antiphonal song. And what that means is there's a call and there's a response. So Ryan's going to lead this song. So he's going to sing the call. And then we are going to join together to sing the response. And as we do that, we're preaching the truth of God to each other. And as we talked about earlier, the nations have come to us. So some of these responses are going to be in English. Some will be in Spanish, some in Yoruba, and one in Portuguese as well. Within our own church at Five Oaks, we have people that speak all of these languages. So I hope that we can realize as we sing this that God transcends languages. He transcends countries. He is such a big God. He's so great. And there is nothing that makes us right with him except the blood of Jesus. So let's sing this together. Lord can wash away my sin. Sing this with us. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the Oh, 
thankful that you gave your son as a sacrifice and that it's only through his blood, his sacrifice and his resurrection that we are saved. That no matter who we are, where we come from, where we live, what we've done, you love us, you died for us and we can have eternity with you because of Jesus. Thank you for the celebrations we get to do today of dedication and baptism and just how joyful and wonderful that is to be together as a body and to celebrate other believers in those decisions they've made. We give this time to you, prepare our hearts too for your word that we be changed and challenged in our faith and to bring that with us throughout our weeks. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for this time. Amen. You may be seated. Hello and welcome. My name is Kelly and I serve as the kids director. And we're just so excited that you're here today and celebrating with us. It's going to be a really fun time ahead. And I also want to welcome anyone who's joining us online. We are live streaming all of our services this weekend um, just because we have friends and family who can't be here for the, the different events and the celebrations that we're doing. And if you are newer to Five Oaks, we definitely want to extend to you a special welcome. We're so glad you're here checking things out. You may be here just in support of someone else, but you also might be here because you genuinely are wanting to get involved or try to figure out what Five Oaks is all about, which is so exciting. And if that is you, we do have an event just for you coming up. It's called Pizza with the Pastors. Just a really great time to get to know um, some staff and pastors, make some connections with other newer people, and just get all your questions answered. And so the next one that's coming up are on May 18th and 19th. We have it right after the 4.30 service and then also at noon. And we do free child care, free pizza and salad for everyone. So it's just, again, just as easy as possible. We'd love for you to come. And it's only about an hour or so. So hopefully, if you're newer and you think that might be for you, um, what you would do is this is your worship guide here. And then you would fill out the bottom portion of it just with your, your name and information and then write pizza on that. And then someone will get in touch with you with any details regarding that. And so um, speaking of that Connect card, we do ask that you fill that out each and every week. You can just write your name on it or you can write down any comments or questions that you have. You can also, um, or you definitely should write down any prayer requests because we love to pray over all of you. And um, so just hearing that, your praises or your struggles, whatever it is, we'd love to, to come alongside you and support. We have a whole prayer team and um, the staff pray and also um, the board and elders. So again, just encourage you to write those things down. And then these connect cards go in the black boxes in the back of this room. They say connect cards and offerings. And there's also more of those black boxes out in the comments. So again, that's what you do with that. You can also do it online if you prefer to do it online. Um, this week we don't have a specific highlight about like a video or anything like that since we're doing our family dedications here in a moment, but I really want you to draw your attention to our worship guide because we have so many things coming up and I just don't want you to miss them. So you can read through our big highlights here, but then also there's a QR code to um, get connected with more online. So again, I just would love for you to take some time to read through all the things and see if there's something that is a good fit for you. All right, we are now going to move into a time of celebrating family dedication. So I'm going to invite up our um, families that are coming. We have three families who are going to be coming up.
Well, at our church, we love to celebrate. Don't you love getting gifts from someone you love? Well, and that is what today is all about. It's a celebration of new life, which is a gift. The Bible says it like this in Psalm 127.3. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. We celebrate family dedications because, again, as the psalm says, children are a gift from God. The Bible teaches us that salvation is a gift from God as well. We want to steward both of these gifts well by walking alongside our kids and helping them unwrap the gift of salvation in their lives. In family dedication, we are committed before God, one another, and the watching world that we will love our children as gifts from God himself. And we will steward our children for God's glory, their good, and as a blessing to the world. Parents, today you are saying, I want to pass on gospel truth to the next generation, and I need God to do this through me. So now let's watch some short videos introducing our families to you. Hi, we're the Draxtons. I'm Jake. And I'm Mary, and this is our child, Robbie. Uh, today we're going to be dedicating Robbie. Um, the verse we chose to read for him is from Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wiggle V's, I'm Juni. Rachel, this is Eli. And this is Evie, for who is being dedicated. And for her Bible verse, we've selected Isaiah 46, 3 through 4. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Hi. Hi. I'm Sally. I'm I'm Sally. I'm Sally. I'm I am Alfani. And this is Yes, we are going to dedicate our son to the Lord. We believe the Lord is a blessing. And that today is his day. So let us read in Isaiah 41, 10. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be anxious, for I am your God. I will fortify you. Yes, I will help you. I will really hold on to you with my right hand of righteousness, in Jesus' name. Well, for this family dedication, we believe it's not only an important step for these children and parents, but also for our congregation to surround them with love and support. And so I will have some questions for the parents that I will start with, and then I will have some questions for you as well. Do you all accept the responsibility as your child's primary faith influencers? Will you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength? We will. Will you love your children with the unconditional love of Christ and pray for them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? We will. All right, and now I will ask all of you, and if you agree with these, please respond with, we will. Will you partner with these parents by praying for them as they lead their children spiritually? Will you partner with these parents by teaching their children with love at church and modeling a Christ-like lifestyle in support of what the parents are teaching and modeling? Yeah. All right, let's pray for these families. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here today and just coming alongside these wonderful families and their beautiful children, and we're so grateful that they want to surrender their lives back to you, God. God, we're so amazed at all that you're doing in all of our lives, Lord, and we just want to pray a special blessing over these children today and pray that their lives would just reflect the love that you've shown to them, God, that they would know you at an early age and be filled with your Holy Spirit, and that they would go forth and testify to all the good and amazing things that you're doing in their lives, Lord. We pray that they would simply be on fire for you in all that they say and do. God, we just pray a blessing over the families as well, that you're with them as the parents are parenting and all the struggles that come along with that, that you would give them patience and wisdom in all that they say and do. And God, we just pray for these kids to live long and wonderful lives, just again, full of your spirit and um, bringing your love to the world, God. 
just watch over all of us as we support them and just remember what a wonderful church family that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's celebrate this decision. It's like a maze walking up here. <laughs> Just completely expecting to fall over sometime or trip over something. Oops, excuse me. All right. A um, couple things before we get started. Uh, one is that uh, these child dedications and their family dedications have been wonderful. I just want to say that. But um, we've got a couple of missionaries with us. They work specifically in the Middle East North Africa area, and that's what they're preparing for. And they've got a table out there, and love for you to just stop by, ask them a little bit about their ministry, get to know them a little bit. It's an area where our missions is focused. Um, our own church, we're partnering with this particular uh, group of people within our Reach Global, our denomination's um, missions. So that sounded really confusing. Sorry. Go on out there and meet them, <laughs> find out what they're doing. They do have some treats, some delicious treats, so you might want to get out there and check that out. So we are in our second part of a sermon that I'm calling uh, Non-Anxious Presence. Uh, it's based on several parables that Jesus tells in Matthew 13, the series that we're in. And last week we focused on the first parable, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. So I'm going to give you a quick overview just in case you missed last week, but also it's a good reminder for all of us. So in the parable... Uh, a farmer plants some wheat, but an enemy comes during the night and plants seeds of weeds. And it's not just any kind of weed. It's a weed that's toxic and that looks like wheat. And it has the potential of ruining, absolutely ruining the crop. And so the servants come in and they basically say, should we just go out? They say, should we go out and pull the weeds? Now, I'm assuming that agricultural people know what the owner is going to say, that that would be Somewhat disastrous to do that because the owner goes, no, just wait. Just wait until the harvest is done, then we'll make the separation. Otherwise, you're going to go out there and you're going to, you're going to pull wheat uh, as well. They look alike. Uh, so uh, the twist in the story uh, is that the owner stays calm while the servants are all kind of going scorched earth. Um, who could have done this? And let's, you know, let's take care of it right away. But he stays calm. He's a non-anxious presence in this story. So the lesson that we took from the parable as it relates to anxiety and fear in our lives is that whatever we're going through, whatever it is that we're facing, this is a, a, a teaching that is from the beginning to the end of the scripture. God is still in charge. He's sovereign. He's present in our troubles. He cares. He has a plan. He's going to accomplish his plan. And he's calm. He's not like us, you know, running around going, ah, the sky is falling. God is a caring and powerful, non-anxious presence, no, what, no matter what the threat is that we're facing. Knowing this, and trusting God doesn't eliminate worry or anxiety or fear. But the more we learn to trust him, the more peaceful we are in these kinds of situations. The more peace we experience in the midst of fear, in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of, of legitimate things that we can worry about. We can learn to reflect more and more his non-anxious presence with us. So last week we talked about a simple prayer practice to help us learn that. And it was a prayer that we can pray whenever we're walking into a pretty highly charged type of situation. And it's the prayer that Jesus, you're already in this situation. 
as we're going into it, Jesus, you're already in this situation. But there's more that we can glean from Jesus' parable in this chapter that can help us prepare for those kind of highly charged, anxiety-inducing moments that we face in our lives. And the hope is that as, uh, that we will more and more reflect the non-anxious presence of Jesus in those kinds of situations. And not only for our own sakes, but also for the sakes of the people around us. And not just for the sake of the people around us, but also for the sake of Jesus, for his honor and for his glory. So we're in a series on Matthew 13. Uh, It's called Secrets of the Realm because Jesus says these parables are secrets about the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one of the Bibles in the seat rack in front of you. And as you're turning, I want to remind you, as we do every week, that understanding the Bible, understanding our place in God's story, understanding the story that God is weaving uh, throughout history, it doesn't have to be a mystery. It doesn't have to be something that we're just walking around in the dark. He reveals it to us in his word, and so we open our Bibles and we see what he has to say, what we need to know uh, going into our futures. So let's pray the prayer together. That'll be on the screen in a moment. God of welcome, thank you for inviting us into your family so that we might sit at your table and feast on your word. May we receive all the nourishment we have prepared for us today through your illuminating spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I reviewed already the one parable. I want to read the other two that we didn't look at last week at all. And then we'll hear from one of our five ochres for the parable, for the, or the explanation of that first parable. So you can pick up in verse 31 in your Bibles. Uh, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches." He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked its way through the dough. All right, so one of our five ochres is going to read to us beginning in verse 36. You can follow along. Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds were pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels, And they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. All right, so last week and this week we're flying kind of high. It's a, a, we're not going into great detail on these parables. We'll, we'll come to some of these themes again uh, later in Matthew as we continue to work our way through Matthew. But there's a common theme that runs through all of this, through all the parables and through the explanation of the parable. And the common theme is, wait for it. That's actually it. Wait for it. <laughs> That's the theme. Wait. So in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, wait for the harvest. In the parable of the mustard seed, wait for the day when the seed grows into a tree. In the parable of the leaven, wait for the leaven to do its work through all the dough. In the explanation of the parable of the wheat and the weeds, wait for judgment, wait for justice. These all speak to uh, daily anxieties, and that's kind of what we're focusing on, but they have really a much bigger picture concern Uh, Jesus is addressing the longing that we all experience for God to make things right in the world, to fix things. We we experience death and wars 
and broken relationships, all the things that, that are going wrong in our world, Jesus is saying to those of us, to, to his people who are saying, when, how long? He's saying, wait, wait for it. Uh, wait for the day when God will again rule, and he will rule in the earthly realm in the same way that he rules in the heavenly realm. On many other weeks here at Five Oaks, we spent a lot of time talking about those big picture issues, but last week and this week, I've tried to bring it down into our daily anxieties uh, that we experience, some of the fears that we experience, and see how that big picture kind of applies to our daily anxieties and fears. So a simple lesson from this. Uh, a simple lesson is take the long view. F- if you're facing a health crisis and it's shaking you up, among other things, take the long view. You're at an extended family dinner during the political season and you know how the last one went. Take the long view. Uh, you're in charge of a project at work and, you, and it's very important, but you're having struggles leading through it. Among other things, take the long view. You're going into a really crucial conversation with someone. It could go south. Take the long view in everything that you say and how you think about it and how you act. Take the long view. There's a book uh, that has had a profound impact on my leadership and really on my, my life in many ways. It's called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. And uh, I've referenced it in your sermon application guide, but I've also talked about it in sermons over the last few years as well. It's, it's part of our continuing education for our governing board, so we've worked through it twice, and I've done it with the staff lead team as well. So the ba- basic idea is that if uh, you use what's called game theory, it's just a, a, soci- a sociological tool for looking at life. If you use uh, a thing called game theory, there are two games that we play in. We play in finite games, and infinite games. I'm not going to be able to give you the great explanation that Simon Sinek could, uh, but I think when I start giving you some examples in a few moments, it'll start falling together for you. But finite games are games that have a very clear beginning and end. There's a score that everybody's following what the score is. Everybody is clear how you win and when you win and how you lose and when you lose. Uh, Everybody agrees to the rules and understand the rules. And what it is that entails a win. What, what does that look like? Um, and how we score it and all that sort of thing. You might have arguments in between on the scoring, but everybody understands this is a win and this is a loss, okay? And these are the rules. Infinite games have no end. Uh, the, and there's, there's no clear way to keep score that everybody agrees on. Infinite games are about, ultimately, about staying in the game. Because there isn't, uh, this is when it ends, this is how score, we all agree on what the score is, under that. It's it's really about longevity. Sinek also makes the point that if you play in, uh, in an infinite game, as if it was a finite game, it can have disastrous results, and it's predictable. So here's the thing. In business, for example, Sinek uh, says that an infinite game, that business is an infinite game, but hardly anybody realizes it. And and the results of that are oftentimes tragic. It negatively impacts people's health and mental well-being. And ultimately, if if people are in it for the long run, you know, in terms of the company health, it impacts the bottom line in the company and the livelihood of all kinds of people and so much more. But here's what is even more tragic. We often conduct our family and friend relationships as if we were in a finite game. For example, as parents, we can tend to sometimes think that this real scorecard, the thing that we really need to be working on, especially at certain phases of life, is what grades are on that report card, or how well behaved our kids are, or the diploma, or the network and potential for getting a great job to make lots of money. Those are some of the things that like, get the attention on the scoreboard, but That's not what the game is about. Our kids are eternal, infinite beings made for God's purposes and for his glory. That's an infinite game. 
Now, Simon Sinek doesn't profess to be a Christian, and he gets that raising kids and doing business aren't finite games. Uh, Certainly, we as followers of Jesus should have a more infinite type of perspective. So when we prioritize, uh, one of the ways that we play our life as if it was a finite game is that we prioritize our story, and then we try to fit God's story into our story, and when we do that, we're playing a finite game. Uh, in other words, we have determined what's most important in life, what the scoreboard is, whatever, however we would you know, define success or happiness or whatever it is. And then if we allow God to be a part of our lives, we expect him to serve our priorities. God's put into, you know, we take God and we try to put him into, fit him into our finite game. Life is a finite game though is mundane. It's ultimately meaningless because it doesn't reflect reality. We fail to see this though because a lot of times those finite games, they're intoxicating (laughs) and there's so many of them and we can move from one to another throughout an entire life before we realize this is meaningless. And so, you know, all of life can be that way. We can get so busy that we wouldn't even notice that what we're doing is meaningless. I tried to think of a way to, to, to illustrate this, and I thought of uh, an, a, a, a person in my extended family who, when he was a kid, was known for his long imaginary sporting events that he would have. So if you would look out the back, you know, window, you'd see this, when he was little, you'd see him carry on for the longest time, an entire basketball game, you know, under his breath. Oh, there he goes. He's going out. Oh, he shoots a three point, you know, and, and keeping score. And okay, that's great. Great imagination, right? But if you're in a real game and one of your teammates is off in a corner oh, yeah, with a fake ball, shooting away from the basket, kind of carrying on their own thing. It's not funny anymore. <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy and silly and, you know, whatever. Um, so when we experience, when, when, if that were to happen, we would go, okay, okay, wait, wait a second. You, you're, you're playing the wrong game. You know, we're, we're in a real game now. From God's perspective, we're in an infinite game. And when we play it as if it was a finite game, we look that silly. And it's meaningless, and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So in these parables, Jesus is obviously coming at it from an infinite, eternal type of timeline. You, you, can, you clearly see that. He's, he's driving home this lesson. He's driving home, take the long view. And greater peace and calm are benefits that we can experience when we take the long view, and trust God uh, with the future. Because a lot of our anxiety has to do with just concerns about the future. Okay, so easier said than done. So what are some of the ways that we can learn to do this? We're going to talk about four practices rather quickly, um, how we can learn to do this. The first practice is mind the gap. Have you ever been to London, London Underground, Subway, uh, the the tube, uh, when a train stops and the doors open, you hear over and over again, mind the gap, mind the gap, all right? And it's what it means is the gap between the, you know, the train and the platform when you're walking, when you're walking on uh, there. So what I'm talking about is minding the gap between something that happens and my response. There's always a gap. It may not feel like it, but there's always a gap. And last Wednesday, our home small group was talking about how difficult it is to pray that prayer. In that gap, that prayer, Jesus, you are already in this situation. Um, In that moment, to pray that in the gap. It only takes a nanosecond for our blood pressure to rise and our brains to get all jumbled up and for us to react in anxious ways to what is happening And so we might withdraw or we might yell or we might attack the person or accuse or blame or screech, you know, all the different things that we do when we get really excited. (laughs) One of our small group members said something like this. She said, my husband will come home and he's a pretty calm guy and he'll tell me something that happened at work. And I immediately, "Ah, I can't believe that, blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, yeah, I can't believe it either. He came in calm. In a few minutes, we're both all riled up. So 
basically what she's describing and what we were lamenting as a small group is our oftentimes inability to even notice the gap, much less leverage the gap for Christ. We get sucked into the situation. It happens, happens everywhere. It happens in those extended family gatherings in the political season. Someone says something that we think is patently outrageous and ill-informed, and we're sucked in before we know it. Here's the second practice. Delay your response. Because minding the gap this is, is very, very exciting difficult. Weekend. We- I'm minding the gap right now. <laughs> uh, that's coming up in a, in a few minutes. Um, all right, so it's delay the, your response. Uh, so uh, did you know that uh, studies have been done on this as to, like, if I were to ask you a question, something that's really on my heart, I really want an answer, or it's like a technical question or whatever, Depending on what country you're in, the average amount of time that people wait to answer is different by country and culture. And so uh, I remember the example she gave was one of the countries that has the longest gap is Japan. And if you were to ask someone, you know, if you're talking about, you know, the gap and you were to say to someone from Japan who kind of fits the average, if you were to say, why do you do that? They would say, well, if I answered right away, it would be like I'm not even actually considering what they are struggling with. Like I'm just, you know, just giving an answer. Americans, really small gap. (laughs) And if you don't jump in (laughs) to the gap, you're pretty much going to be left out of the conversation. Um, That's pretty much how it is. So, we mind the gap when we learn to delay our responses. And so James, that's what James is talking about. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, I pray this regularly. I pray this prayer regularly in my life because I don't have a good gap. <laughs> okay. And, um, but here's the thing. We're never going to do this until we believe this. I mean, really believe this. Because a lot of us, really don't, we really don't believe that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And one of the ways that we get around it is we say, well, that's not human anger. I'm feeling God's righteous anger, <laughs> like all the time. <laughs> Might want to think about that one a little bit more. But when we understand this and we're learning, we're going to be slower to speak. We're going to mind the gap. We're going to delay our response because we know that our first response isn't always one that produces righteousness, God's righteousness. So it's notoriously difficult for a lot of us. So here's another practice uh, that can help us, and that's to slow down. And by slow down, I mean slow down. (laughs) Like, in general, slow down. The Christian life, the, the, the life that's described in Scripture, the, the life that Jesus called us to, I mean, literally called us to, these, just said, when you do these things, when you read the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, uh, when you all do these things, it's just assuming these are the things you do because you're a follower of Jesus. It has all these times to slow down built in to what we're called to live. So we're expected and called to meditate on Scripture. That's not just a quick reading. (laughs) Meditate, reflect on Scripture. We're called to gather together for worship regularly. Uh, We're called to rest We're called to eat meals joyfully with friends and family. If I'm not, if you're not slowing down to do those kinds of things that the Scripture calls us to do, I'm not, you're not living the Christian life. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm just saying you're not living like one. (laughs) You're literally not living like one. You're not doing the things that that he says to do, which happen 
to slow us down. John Ortberg has an entire chapter. I put his book, one of his books in, uh, it's called The Life You Always Wanted in the outlines. Uh, And he has a whole chapter on what he calls the discipline of slowing. And then I've also included in the outlines a couple of sermons I did on Sabbath, on Sabbath rest when we were back in chapter 11 or 12 of Matthew. Okay, one last practice. Revise the scoreboard. Revise the scoreboard. In an infinite game, the two, or in a fi- finite game, the two most important things on a scoreboard are always what the score is, what the points are, and how much time. Where, where are you in the game? How much, which basically you're always thinking, how much time do we have left? All right. To either defend our lead or to advance, uh, get to get a lead or to, you know, get way ahead or whatever. You, those are the two main things. There's all other, other things, what, you know, like, um, you know, how many balls and strikes or what down is it and how many yards, those kinds of things. But the two most important, the ones that are always prominent, are the score and the time. In football, it's usually the score right here and the time, you know, and basketball, the same thing. Score and the time. So, um, in an infinite game, Cynic says that when you have an infinite scorecard in business, it's, it's really about trying to stay in the game as long as possible. Uh, because there is no, you know, you can make your arbitrary score. We're going to get this many sales and all this kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with doing some of those things. But if that becomes the ultimate thing, it's not good. It's, it's, it has some predictably bad results. Um, so he says in an infinite scorecard, it's going to be about staying in the game. And you're, to stay in the game, you're going to have to focus on relationships. You're going to have to develop people and relationships on your staff. Whatever organization it is, you're also going to develop relationships and care about your customers. Uh, so that's, that's how you play an infinite game. So uh, one of the people that plays pickleball here, I play pickleball with, is in his early 80s. His name is Gary, he's in this service. Somebody said I should make him stand up, but I won't. <laughs> plays really well. <laughs> and um, so one day he was going to the gym, he'll remember this. And I go, Gary, remember the goal is, and I've brought it up other times, the goal is to play another day. <laughs> That's the goal, to play another day. Uh, what I meant, and he knew what I meant, is that don't get hurt doing something dumb. <laughs> you know, uh, don't dive for the ball when you're in your 80s <laughs> or 65. <laughs> don't dive for the ball. Uh, that means you're going to see some balls that are like, oh boy, it's going over my head. It's just a point. That's what you got to say in your head. It's just a point. It doesn't really matter. He said, I want to play again tomorrow. <laughs> and I want to play a week from now because it has so many good health benefits and all of that. You just, you just let it go. The goal isn't winning. What's the scorecard? The scorecard is playing again. <laughs> it's continuing to play. So you're not playing to win at all costs. Yeah, you can be a little competitive. That's, that's good. But the score is not the ultimate, it's not, whatever the score is in the game is not what's on your scoreboard. Um, And if, this is my personal opinion, but if you are so competitive that you can't play like that, you shouldn't be playing active sports in your 80s. It's just, it's just natural, I mean, it's just, you shouldn't be. Um, Again, probably in my age as well. So... It was probably a little confusing to him that same day when I yelled at him for not diving for the ball. (laughs) He looked at me like, of course, I was just kidding. Sort of. Um, So what's on the scorecard, scoreboard for followers of Jesus? Time is seen as eternity. That's the clock. Um... The points, the score, relates them to everything that impacts eternity. Everything that's going to make a difference in eternity. Everything that I'm going to take with me into eternity. That's what's on the scoreboard. Um, I shared this before many times, actually, but I'll share it again. When my kids were younger, I used to pray this prayer, basically, that 
I mean, the short version of it, may my kids go to heaven. <laughs> you know, that was the short version, all right? And I realized that was too short-sighted. Because the Bible doesn't talk about heaven out there. It talks about eternity, and eternity starts now. And so what I started praying for my kids was that they would love Jesus deeply and live on mission for him. Okay, that, that's an infinite game. Love Jesus deeply and live on mission for him. It's what I pray, still pray for my kids, but also pray for my grandkids on a regular basis. So what does winning look like to use the election season family gatherings um, again? Uh, especially if the last few gatherings haven't gone well for you. A win doesn't have to be keeping your mouth shut. It's what you might think, but I, don't, I really don't think it means keeping your mouth shut. It means prioritizing relationships while speaking the truth or truthfully, truthfully, or speaking truthfully while prioritizing relationships. What's winning in your marriage or in your friendships when you're in an infinite game? What's winning when you're coaching kids in sports? When you're playing an infinite game? What's winning when you're playing sports when you're in an infinite game? What's winning at work when you're playing an infinite game? Whatever it is, it's going to be something that takes the long view, the Jesus long view. And to get better at that, you're going to practice minding the gap. You're going to practice delaying your response. You're going to practice slowing down. You're going to practice revising your scoreboard. It doesn't happen automatically. It takes practice. And with practice, you will begin more and more to, uh, with that practice, you'll begin more and more to reflect the non-anxious presence of our God in all your relationships. So we begin our time of response. Let's take the bread and the cup and remember the grace of God shown through the death of Jesus, the grace of God that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We sang about it earlier, about his blood. Every time we sing a song that talks about the blood of Jesus, I always think, who might be sitting in here who just doesn't, never heard that before, how weird that must sound. But Jesus spilled his blood. He died for our sins. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Scripture tells us that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the privilege of remembering we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you, Father, that Jesus died for our sins. But he didn't die for our sins only. He died for all our good that we bring to the table, which compared to Jesus' righteousness and goodness is garbage. But all of that goes to Jesus on the cross, and we get his righteousness, his rightness with you. Help us to live in that reality, to live in the joy of that, the peace of that. And as we walk in the reality of your presence with us, change us, transform us into people of peace, people of joy, people of kindness, people of the fruit of the Spirit. Produce that in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our response in a number of ways. We're going to, we're going to sing. Uh, 
we're going to pray. You can pray right where you are, but you can also go to that corner. There's a, a kneeling bench where you can pray. There are uh, two light stations up here. And these are stations where you can come and pray and pray for the light of Christ and the life of someone you know who's far from God. So it's not about lighting a candle. It's about as you light the candle, praying for the light of Christ and the life of someone you know who's far from God, needs the light of Christ in their life. We're going to break to watch um, a video of the baptisms that happened earlier. And, um, uh, but these are all the ways that we're going to respond. Let's continue our worship by responding together. If you choose to stand to respond, I invite you to do that now. is calm and all is right when i feel your favor flood my life even in the good i'll follow you even in the good i'll follow you when the boat is tossed upon the waves when i want to celebrate a baptism uh, this morning uh, and what we're celebrating is an outward expression 
of an inward reality. My name is Jolie Bonner. I am eight years old and I gave my life to Jesus when I was six years old. I gave my life to Jesus when I was homeschooling with my mom. We were reading the Bible together and I asked my mom what it means to give your life to Jesus. She said, it's when you know that you have sinned and done wrong and you ask Jesus into your heart and for him to forgive your sins. I said, yes, I want to do that. Then my mom helped me say a prayer asking Jesus to forgive my sins. You are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. My name is Cameron Dodd. I'm nine years old and in the third grade. I accepted Jesus as my savior when I was about six years old in my bed. We prayed for Jesus to enter my heart. Jesus has really helped me knowing that he is with me. I can just put my life in his hands and let him be the shepherd and me the lamb. I have chosen to be baptized because I feel that is what Jesus wants. I'm here today to publicly profess that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. You are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is my testimony. Come down. Run for cover, but the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven, hey! and I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Yes, I do. Still the miracle that I just can't get over.
Cause Christ rewrote my story I'll testify That Jesus Christ the righteous I'll testify Um, I don't think I mentioned it earlier. I might have, but I get confused sometimes. Uh, we have a baptism happening this summer off-site over at Northwestern University St. Paul. And if you would like more information about that, the class that we offer, it's for all ages uh, of people who profess uh, Christ to be their Lord and Savior. So write baptism on your card, and we'll get you the information that you need for that. All right. Be sure to, those of you who are Five Oakers, be sure to spend some time getting to know some of the people around you. Um, saying hi, greeting them. All right, so I invite you now to place your hands in a posture of receiving as we pray the benediction and we are sent to continue our response to God. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you are blessed and you are sent. Have a great week. You are-